Have you ever wondered why oftentimes um, when you look at the things going on in your life and you look at what's going on around you, you can't catch a break? Anybody ever been in that spot where you can't catch a break? Um, and those who aren't acknowledging that, you're lying. Because there are times where we all feel like we can't catch a break. And um, and so tonight, tonight I want to. Ad- I'm going to be addressing one of the main reasons why, when we are seeing the prosperity or or the deliverance or the or the walking with the Lord and walking with others in such a way to where our relationships are good, our families are good, our lives are good, and we and we wonder why not. I'm going to be addressing some of the reasons tonight. I have a lot of scripture. I'm not even going to go through most of them. I'm just going to hit some high points um, for the sake of time. And um, I want you to hear what I'm saying, because at the end of this of this time of, of teaching, preaching, whatever we want to call it, I'm going to be challenging you. I'm going to be challenging you to examine some things. And I'm going to be challenging you to come into agreement with the kingdom of heaven. So over tonight and the next two weeks, uh, we're going to be talking about what the power of agreement looks like. You understand that the, the whole Christian life, the whole Christian life is based on what we agree with. Well, life in general is, is, is based on what we agree with. You understand that, right? So what you come into agreement with will determine the trajectory and the, and the impact of the things that take place in your lives. And so, for example, so for example, a few weeks ago, I was ministering to a, um, a young lady with, with some other people, and she had some horrible things that happened to her that nobody should ever have happened to her. And immediately, what she did through these circumstances and, and as a response to, to these things that took place in her life, she came into agreement with the enemy, with Satan, and stepped into this place of massive unforgiveness towards these people who abused her, mistreated her, and she invited the enemy into her life. And the fruit of her life was, was fruit that the enemy was producing in her life. And so for about an hour, we sat together, and she began to then come into agreement with the heart of God, and she began to forgive these people who brought such terrible pain to her, and you could see the freedom and the liberty as she, came, as she left agreement with the enemy and joined into agreement with the Lord, how everything shifted. And this is the thing that we have to come into agreement with the kingdom and the, and the ideas that God, the way that God calls things to be, and if we're not in agreement with him, we are by default in agreement with the enemy. Oh, come on, Pastor Lee, isn't there middle ground? Well, maybe, maybe there's middle ground, but this is the way I see the middle ground. Uh, Jesus says, to the church of Laodicea in Revelation, he says, you're either hot nor, neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, because you're living in the middle ground, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You understand that? I mean, let's face it. Lukewarm coffee sucks. Right? They don't, that, you don't see Dunkin' Donuts offering lukewarm coffee. Like, come and get our lukewarm press. You don't see that. They do hot, and they do cold. They don't do room temperature. You know why? Because it sucks. I'm like, can I get an amen? <clears throat> and so this is, this is the thing. There is no middle ground. You're either in agreement with the Lord and the kingdom of heaven. And when we say the kingdom of heaven, what we need to make sure that you understand is we are not talking about the church. We're not talking about the church. You know, so many people go to church and they do the different things that they do and and they've come into this idea that everything they do do is 
It's We're building the kingdom of God. You can't build an unshakable kingdom. It's built. We're talking, when we say the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, we're talking about the government of God. The government of God is always expanding. And the government of God, that's why... That's why we say here that we're not political, but we are governmental, because God is governmental. That is why, that is why uh, last Friday, Brandon and I decided to do a, a walk around the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., and we began to make decrees over the Supreme Court so that it would come into agreement with the kingdom of God. And so what we have to come to this understanding is what we agree with and, and what we come into agreement with determines really who we are living our lives for and who we are surrendered to. And it's, listen, this, there is no black, there is no gray. It's either black or white. There is no middle ground because the middle ground gets spit out of your mouth, out of his mouth like lukewarm coffee. And you understand, you understand when Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea, the first thing he does is he rebukes them. And he says, and he says this thing where he says, you, you, have, you have plenty of prosperity. Does that sound like America? You have plenty of prosperity. He says, he says but you're poor in spirit. You're, you're wretched in spirit. And then he says, he says you can't see. And you're naked. You ever wonder why Jesus said those things to them? This is not even my sermon. But here we go. It's because Laodicea was the most interesting thing. There was a great earthquake that happened in that region. And Laodicea was so wealthy because they produced the most elegant, valuable black fabric from black sheep. And it, and it created a great industry for the city, and they were very prosperous. And not only that, they had this salve that they created that they could put on eyes that were having problems, and they would be healed. So when Jesus says, you're naked, he says, listen, all that value you put in that fabric that you make to clothe yourselves, it's no value at all. That stuff that you make to put on your eyes that brings healing in the physical, in the spiritual, it's non-existent. And the reason that you're lukewarm is you have to understand Laodicea had no source of water. They had no source of water. And so there was a city to the east that had hot springs, like Hot Springs, Arkansas, you know, that have healing power and, and that sort of thing. And there was a, a city to the west that had cold, refreshing water. Well, they built aqueducts because they were prosperous. Instead of drilling a well themselves, they built aqueducts to pull the water from these other two cities. And by the time it got to them, the hot water was cool, and the cool water was hot, not good for anything. And so when Jesus is saying this, he's saying, listen, you were created for a purpose, and your purpose was not to be not good for anything. And so what we come into agreement with determines where we stand. And we know this. In, in Matthew 18, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth and ask about anything, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So this whole idea is what you come into agreement with moves heaven. When you when you come into agreement with brothers and sisters on things that are built upon the kingdom of heaven, it moves heaven. It's not that, it's not that God is, is, is sitting there saying, oh, what are they going to bring? I hope I can deliver it. It's a system he's already created. If we come together and we ask anything that is in accordance to the kingdom, he, heaven is systematically moving to bring it. He doesn't even have to consider it because he's already established the thing that we come into agreement with. And so what we come into agreement with and who we come into agreement with are so important. And so I'm not going to read the scriptures because it's just so many. Um, 
and I would spend the entire time reading scriptures. But make a note of this. 1 Samuel 25 is the story of Nabal, or Nabal, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and Abigail, and David. And it's interesting because in verse 3, it says, Now the man, the name of the man was Nabal. And Nabal means foolish, senseless fool. The scriptures actually tell you his name. And when we see this in the Old Testament, when anybody is said to be a fool, what that means, what that means is that they have no fear of the Lord in them. When you see that in the Old Testament, when somebody is referred to as a fool, it says that they have no fear of the Lord in them. And he was married to this woman named Abigail, and her name means my father's joy. And so, and so if we look at the story, and, and you look at the story, what happens is this is, this is the season in David's life before, before he becomes king, but he's been anointed king. Saul is king. Okay? And so David sends some of his men to Nabal and to say, to greet him in his name. So he sends his men to Nabal. He says, go up to Carmel. This is in verse 5. He says, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And he says, greet him like this. Peace be to you and peace be to your house. <clears throat> peace be to all that you have. And he goes on and on. And so in verse, and, and so when David's men in verse 9 go to Nabal and do that, Nabal's response is this, who is David? Right? He said, go greet him in my name. Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? This doesn't mean anything to me. And so what Nabal is, Nabal is basically saying is he's saying, listen, David may have had oil poured over his head by Samuel, but I'm coming into agreement with who's king now. I'm coming into agreement with Saul. Nabal was, Nabal was um, in alignment and in agreement with Saul, who, who really, in, in, in the scriptures, is one of the saddest people that I've ever seen because he had an opportunity to be David's mentor into being king, but instead he became his tormentor. And so Nabal came into alignment and agreement with Saul. He did not know that he did not know what was coming. He did not know what was coming in Saul's life. He did not know that Saul was going to be removed as king and David be made king, but he he made a choice. I'm going to be, I'm going to come into agreement and alignment who is the political <laughs> political authority now. You have some. I would love them. You know, it's interesting. This time of year, every year, I have about six weeks where my allergies cause me to cough like this. And I've gone back and looked at videos in the past around this season, and I'm sucking on cough drops. So you'll have to bear with me. And, and so Nabal, who is described as a fool because he does not have fear of the Lord, he is in agreement with, with Saul. But his wife, on the other hand, his wife, on the other hand, it says in verse 23, it says, When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from her donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. So she's going on behalf because she realizes that her husband is a doofus. And she's going and she's, and she's trying to make things right because she knows what's going on. And she says, let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. So she's saying, listen, he's a fool. He's a fool. Don't hold him against him. He, he was named a fool. He can't, he can't do anything but be a fool. This is what his name means. This is what his name means. He can't help it. And so what happens? Here's what happens, right? So Abigail, she sees who David is. She knows who he is. 
So she aligns him, herself. She comes into agreement of the kingship of David before he's ever king. And she comes into alignment with him and agreement with him. And so what happens is, this is so important, right? So the prophecies that were spoken over Saul about him being removed as king because, because Nabal comes into agreement with him, he comes into those same prophecies over his own life. But Abigail, on the other hand, and, and you see that, you see that in verse, in verse uh, 36, 36. It says, And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. And in the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart dropped, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. So this is very interesting. This is very prophetic. In verse thirty-seven, it says, "When the wine had gone out of him." In the Old Testament, when we see the when we see the the language like that with wine, it's it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And so, so Nabal came into agreement with Saul, and it led to death. Now, Abigail, as if you continue to read the story, and I'm not going to, she came into agreement with David, and it led to life. In fact, she marries David, and she becomes prosperous because of it, and because all the prophecies that were spoken over him, she was able to come into agreement with him for, over her life. And so the power of agreement is this thing that says what I'm in agreement with is what I am bringing into my life, over my life, coming, allowing in my life. And we see the same thing. We see the same thing in 2 Samuel 15, and I'm not going to read it, but the story is about David's son Absalom. And, and he sits outside the city, and he sits outside the city because his goal is to convince people to align themselves with him over his father, the king. Because his desire is to overthrow the king. And so he sits out in front of the city and he, and he, says, and he says things like this, you know, in verse 4, um, you know, that he would give men justice, that he would do these things. And then he, and then he um, sent secret messengers in verse 10 where he says, go throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, say that Absalom is king at Hebron. And so what happened, and then if you continue to read in verse 12, it says, and the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. See, here's the thing that you have to realize, is that there is, a, there is an enemy to the very kingdom I was talking about earlier. And this enemy functions and operates different than the Lord. Because the Lord is not going to manipulate you for your allegiance. You're either going to be committed to him and come into agreement with him, or you're not. It's very simple. He is who he is. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not going to change and manipulate you to come into agreement with him because like Pastor Rick says, if I have to convince you to choose Jesus, I'm going to have to chase you around every day and convince you to follow him on a daily basis. But whoever you come into agreement with is the one in which you live for. And see, the enemy functions like Absalom. He functions like Absalom in such a way to where he says things where I will meet your needs. This thing that you, I'm calling you into agreement with will meet your needs because you're waiting for the Lord to do it and it's not happening. And the reason it's not happening is because you're waiting for the Lord to provide something for you that he never intended for you to have. And so, you know, you, you're, you find yourself walking in loneliness. And the Lord says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So why are you lonely? And so... 
we come into agreement with sexual immorality just so that we don't feel lonely for a moment. We feel as though our physical, financial needs aren't being met by the Lord, but yet we don't trust Him with our finances. We don't come into agreement. See, if you don't come into agreement with your finances and you cry because the Lord isn't providing for you, you need to quit crying and start giving. The Lord never withholds things from generous people. This is the craziest thing. I'm, I'm just waiting to see what's going to happen next. Because in the last four or five weeks, I told you guys about the story when Pastor Rick and I were in Satellite Beach and the lady who was ministering at this conference falls off the stage. It was a little higher than this. And I, she calls me forward. She falls off the stage and I catch her in midair. Like, falls off the stage. I catch her in midair. Her husband slips a $20 bill in my pocket. And she, the lady gives me the microphone. Many of you may have heard of her. Her name is Jane Hammond. She's an internationally known prophetic voice. Um, and then last week, I'm at this meeting in Virginia. And I get prayed for, completely destroyed by the Holy Spirit. I'm just a mess. I can't hardly stand up. Actually, I couldn't stand up. I'm having to lean against a chair just to get my composure. And this lady that's part of the ministry team is ministering to me. And then she says, don't go anywhere. You know, the first time the husband puts a 20 in my pocket, the lady says, don't go anywhere. And she comes back and she slips me a 50. She says, the Lord wants you to have this. And what's interesting is both in both cases, within 24 hours of that money coming into my pocket, he showed me somebody to put it into there. Because I came into agreement with what God was doing. So I'm waiting for the event to happen where he's going to put 100 in my pocket and I'm going to pass that on too. It's not like it's my money, so what's the difference? You know what I mean? And so if we're asking God to, if we're asking God to bless our finances, but yet we're not into a, in agreement with the way he says to handle them, what do we expect? What do we expect? And so when we consider these things, what are we in agreement with? What have we come into agreement with? Because I started off tonight asking the question, have you ever, have you wondered why certain things aren't happening the way that they should be happening in your life? Well, the, the next question you need to ask yourself, what am I, what have I come into agreement with in my life that I shouldn't be in agreement with? You know, earlier tonight, we were, we were asked, what are some things that the Lord has been working on us and, 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 um, and we've been called to repent. And people, somebody shared, you know, that the Lord has challenged them and, and they repented in the things that they watch on television. You realize that the things you watch on television, you're coming into agreement with them. What are you in agreement with? What, what areas of our lives, and listen, this is, this is a hard statement what I'm about to make. But every single person in the room, including myself, have areas in our lives in which we have partnered with the enemy. We have come into agreement with the enemy, and these are the areas in which we have to call them out for what they are, quit, quit petting them, justifying them, arguing for them, and those sort of things. We have to stop. You have to stop. And so, you know, like, for example... I'm going to really make some people mad here in a second. And that's okay. I'm married. I'm used to somebody being mad at me regularly. So... We're, we're on the 10th day of October and at the end of the month is the devil's unholy day. And the church who, who has compromised itself 
has come into agreement with the enemy through its fall festivals, its trunk or treats, its all of these things. I'm telling you. And then all, and some of you might even be sitting there going, but you know, we don't participate in evil stuff. Just by going and doing, you're participating in the evil stuff. I'm sorry. You are coming into agreement with the enemy. But we just go for candy. Well, do you know that there are Satanist um, groups that actually go and pray over the candy? Do you know that? Well, you do now. Well, you know, we dress up like Abraham. So what? You're coming into agreement with the enemy. And why would we even flirt with that? And you want to know why sometimes our children are struggling spiritually? It's because we have come into agreement with things that we should never be in agreement with in our homes. It's time that the church grow a backbone. And when I say the church, I don't mean an organization. I mean you and me as individuals that say, stand up and say, no. I am not coming into agreement with a society that says that it is okay to kill babies in and out of the womb. I am not coming into agreement with a society that says one people group is more valuable than another people group. I'm not doing it. Neither should you. Because Jesus died for all. And when we, when we do that, when we do that, when we come into agreement with there's one people group that's more important than another people group, what we're doing is we are bowing down before Nebuchadnezzar. It makes me sick. It makes me sick to see these professional athletes who are bowing their knees on a sideline. They're not bowing because of a national anthem. They're bowing down before a false god of identity. That's what it is. They're bowing down just like they bowed to Nebuchadnezzar and it's time for the Shadrachs and the Meshachs and the Abednegoes to stand up and not come into agreement with that. Who cares that LeBron James can play basketball well? That's, if that's your only skill to have a voice in society, give me a break. Everything he says is stupid. It is. It's stupid. Why do people allow him to have a voice? Because people have come into agreement with the enemy. They have come into agreement that these physical talents should give a voice over society. When, when I know that the word of God is the only thing that should have a voice over our society. What are we doing? What are we coming into agreement with? What are, we, what are we watching? What are we doing? What are we, you know, listen. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for shutting me up. When we defend the witchcraft that's in Disney movies and, and say that, well, it's just fun and fantasy, and our children are reading books and speaking curses over other people, and they're watching these movies and they're speaking curses. We are, we are putting our children on the altar of the enemy in order to come into agreement with society. And if you wonder why your kids are having nightmares, and you wonder why your kids are walking in rebellion, and you wonder why your kids are doing the things they're doing, it's because you're putting them in front of a TV and you're letting the enemy get their little minds to come into agreement with him. You should have heard what I was thinking about saying. Because if we're not coming into the agreement with the scriptures and the personhood of God, we are coming into agreement with a, word that, a world that is trying to seduce and manipulate us. And that's as simple as it is. That's as simple as it is. There are philosophies, ideologies, political thought processes that are trying, and listen, I'm talking both in this country, I'm talking Republicans and Democrats are trying to twist you up. 
Don't come into agreement with either one of them. Come into agreement with the kingdom of heaven. Plain and simple. They're all crooked. They're all drinking out of the same well. But the Lord isn't going to try to manipulate you to come into agreement with him. He's not even going to try to convince you. He has already invited you. What does it look like to come into agreement with the Lord? I love this little, simple, obscure passage out of the book of Amos. It says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? You can't walk with him unless you've agreed with him. You can't walk with the Lord, right? The scriptures refer to, to our, our relationship with God as a walk, right? And, and the scriptures say that his word is like a lamp unto our path, indicating that we're walking with him, that there's a path that we're walking with him. We can't walk with him unless we've agreed with him. I can't walk with you unless we've agreed to go to the same place. We can't do it. It's not possible. You know, my wife and I, we used to, when we were first married, we would go on walks together. We lived in Austin, Texas, in this neighborhood. And it was hilly. I'm a stroller. I like to stroll. And she thought we were in a race. We were not in agreement. I don't know. But they weren't there. We were not in agreement. And we didn't walk together. And so this, this passage is really simple, but... You can't walk together unless you're in agreement. The Lord is calling us to walk with him, which requires us to be in agreement with him. Right? And there's areas in our lives where we are not in agreement with him. And the reason I know that applies to everybody in the room is because we all have this thing, this nature in us that is constantly fighting with the Lord. Listen, I've had some conversations in the last week with some people about the Halloween discussion. And it was so interesting. So interesting. How people defend their right to be in agreement with the enemy of their soul. What would happen if freaking Christians would start fighting so hard to come into agreement with the Lord? What would happen if we said, oh my God, I'm going to repent and I'm going to use the same energy that I did to come into agreement with the enemy, to come into agreement with the Lord, and I'm going to lay my life down before him. What would happen? And that's the issue. I could not believe some of the conversations I was having with some people. And, and they're sitting there arguing with me. Well, they're not arguing because I don't argue. Only fools argue. And if you argue with a fool, you're really a fool. I don't argue. And I'm listening and I'm saying, what? what is going on inside the heart to fight, to stay in agreement with the enemy rather than to come into agreement with the Lord? What would happen if we started fighting for, for coming into agreement with the Lord in the same way that we fight for the world? What would happen? Think about this. You would be walking in agreement every through the Holy Spirit, through the body of Christ, through the scriptures, through any type of thing of that nature. What would happen if you repented in that area, changed the way you think, and then got into alignment with God, got into agreement with Him? Do you think that you're not going to experience? transformation? How is that even possible? What you come into agreement with 
is the thing that is going to establish the course of your life. Whatever you're in agreement with. And see, we're called to be in agreement with one another. We're called to be in agreement with one another as the body. We don't have to agree, but we should be in agreement. I don't have to agree with everything that you believe, like theological or whatever, but we should be in, agree we should be in agreement as to who we are and who each other are. I should be in agreement with Jesus in you, and you should be in agreement with Jesus in me. You follow? And so, what would happen? I don't know. I think, I think if the church would start, it, the church would start grabbing a hold of things and fighting to come into agreement with the Lord in the same way that we have defended being in agreement with the enemy, we would turn this world upside down. Listen, there's been times in my life where I have submitted myself to people in ministry and I've come into agreement with them. And it was probably the most blessed seasons. In, or I'm, still in, I'm still in these seasons, um, but they just change. Um, you know, 15 years ago, Shannon and I entered into a season of agreement in a ministry and it was the right time of our life. And we experienced blessing, we experienced relational blessing, we experienced ministry blessing, you know, and, and then currently, you know, we're, we're in agreement with a couple of ministries that are international ministries. And ever since we've come into agreement with these people who are in agreement with the Lord, we have seen so much of an outpour of God's grace. So much. You know, I, I, I think about the first time that we started hanging around Randy Clark and, and Global Awakening and what God has done just by coming into agreement with that stream. And we have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of physical healing. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. Just, just in the area, think about how crazy this is. Now, not everybody experiences it, so don't get all mad at God. Maybe the reason it's not happening is you're not coming into agreement. Over 30 people medically verified healed of hepatitis C. And if you, and you know, here's the deal. Uh, maybe you need to come into agreement that he's your healer. Because I know this, that there's churches in this country and, and in this world that don't believe that God moves supernaturally. And you go into their churches, and guess what you uh, you see every time you go there? No super signs and wonders. And they don't believe it. They haven't come into agreement with it. Why would the Lord do in our midst what we haven't come into agreement with? So, you know, really this, over the next couple of weeks, this really isn't about sin management. Because you can't manage it. This isn't about coming, you know, just realizing all the bad things in the world and not coming into agreement with those so that we can come into agreement with the Lord. But we do need to address the things that are keeping us from coming into agreement with the Lord. And then we have to learn to come into agreement with who He is and who He is in us. Think about this just for a second. When I talk to people, and I talk to a lot of people, and I ask them these questions, and one of the questions I ask is, do you continue to sin? And they'll say, well, of course. Well, why? Well, I'm a sinner. Oh, then that's disagreement with God. That's a disagreement with God. Because the Word says you're a saint. So right there, there's an area where I have to come into agreement with Him. Or, or here's, here's the one that I love. I'm only human. How many are only human? Any, is everybody in here only human? Well, if you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit has been sealed in you, and you're at least one-third divine. So you're not only human, so you can't use that as an excuse. And so the thing is, I'm coming into agreement with a lie that says my humanity is the reason for my sin, rather than coming into agreement that the divinity of God living inside me is the thing that allows me to overcome sin. What am I coming into agreement with? 
Whatever I come into agreement with is the thing that will establish the path of my life. We come into this agreement that I'm a victim. Well, if you believe and you've come into agreement that you're a victim, you're going to always be victimized. But if you come into agreement that you're more than a conqueror, conqueror and you're a victor, you will always experience victory. Always. You know, truthfully, as I've looked at things, I've experienced some bumps. But I don't, since, since I've come into agreement with who Christ says that I am, I don't think I've ever experienced defeat. Not once. Not once. And so in Leviticus 26, it says, You shall not make idols for yourself or erect an image or a pillar. You, you shall not set up a figured stone in your land and bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. So, so what he's saying is you, you're not to come into agreement with false images. Don't come into agreement with false gods. I'm the Lord your God. Don't come into agreement with any of those other things. And you know, listen. in the room don't put your children on those pillars and turn them into false images of God don't do it in fact they should be an offering up to him sacrifice it's so interesting you, you know the word uh, you've heard the, the, the name of God Jehovah Jireh you've heard that everybody heard that Jehovah Jireh my provider Right? I remember the old song in the 70s. Yeah, we used to kind of do the little Jewish dance around church. I love it. Remember that, Paul? Don't get him stuck in the drum rhythm. You know that word only appears one time in all of Scripture. One time. And it's when Abraham is bringing Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah to sacrifice him to the Lord. And he says, he says, Dad, where's the sacrifice? He says, don't worry, God will provide. That's Jehovah Jireh. God doesn't provide for your desires. He provides for your sacrifice. God isn't, pro listen, we, we say, oh, I need to go buy a new car. My Jehovah Jireh is going to get me a loan. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's going to provide a sacrifice that you can lay on the altar so that you can come into agreement with him. That's the way it works. He's going to provide the money to lay down a sacrifice of finances before him. He's going to provide the children to lay down a sacrifice, I don't mean literal, of your children before him. Or no, sometimes we want to. And then in verse 2, he says, Leviticus 26, he says, yeah, You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary, because I am the Lord. So he's basically saying, walk with me. Walk with me. Honor me. You're going you're gonna to come into agreement with me. You're going to come into agreement with my systems. You're going to come into agreement with my flows. You're going to come into agreement with my rhythms. You're going to come into agreement. You're going to revere me. You're going to honor the Sabbath. You're going to honor my laws. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to flow. And then in verse 3 says, and if walk, because you've agreed, right? Amos 3.3 3 says that you'll only walk with whom you've agreed. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them because you're in agreement with them, then I will give you your rains in their seasons and the land shall yield its increase. 
and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. The reason that we're not experiencing the yield and the fruit that we think we should be yielding in our lives is because we are not walking in agreement with the Lord. We have areas in our lives where we have walked in agreement with the enemy, and by walking in agreement with the enemy, we have stunted the growth, we have stopped the rain, we have stopped the production, and the God and the Lord says, I just I just want to rain on your fields so that they will grow. I want to I want to do these things in your life. I want you to come into agreement with me so that your life will produce fruit, not just a little bit of fruit, but a bunker crop. But you say, oh, but Lord, it's just a little bit of soft porn on Netflix. It's okay. It's the story that I care about. Well, you're coming into agreement with the enemy. And you wonder why your marriage is struggling. But, but, but Lord, it's my money. I can use it how I want to. Well, if you read Second Chronicles 29, 11, and 12, it clearly says that it's his and that he gave it to you. And not only did he give it to you, he gave you the intelligence and the skills in order to earn it. Because he says everything in the heavens and earth is his. So when we come into agreement with these things, what we're doing is we are actually releasing the government of God in our lives so that we can experience the rain in the seasons of drought and the fruit in the seasons of famine. Famine. That's the thing that we have to realize. When we come into agreement with God, when everything around us, it looks as though it's dried and withered, when we come into agreement with Him, we're going to walk in His blessing. And there's no harm in asking for His blessing, but He can't bless something that's not in agreement with Him. Haven't you ever wondered why certain people, even in times of recession, their businesses grow? Because God's blessing them. Time and time and time again. And so tonight as we end, my question that I started off the night with, or my statement was that I was going to ask you to respond to the things in which the Lord reveals to you that you are not in agreement with, with Him. Repent for the things that you are walking in agreement with the enemy. I'm asking you to do this, and, I'm ask, and I've asked the Lord to reveal these things to you as I'm talking. And so if you have ha been having thoughts pop into your mind, and you try to push them down, the reason they're popping up is because before tonight, I asked the Lord to pop them up. And so if you're pushing them down, you're resisting the Lord. The Lord wants, to, the Lord wants you in agreement with him. He wants you to fight as hard to be in agreement with him as you have fought to be in agreement with the enemy. You know, I was talking to a guy. He had probably a 15-year drug addiction. And he's destroyed every relationship that he's had. Financial ruin. His health is a mess. And he says to me, he says, I want to keep doing what I've done. I just don't want the consequences associated with that. But in the same conversation, he was saying that he wants the fruit that my life produces. He says, I want a family. I want stability. I want this. I want that. But yet he's unwilling to come into agreement with the things that I've came into agreement with in order to have them. And so, because I'm warm and fuzzy and gentle, I just patted him on the butt and said, it'll be okay, son, you'll figure it out. 
you know, I yelled at him and told him to get his head out of his rear end and come into agreement with the Lord. But when we start to come into agreement with who he says he is and who he says we are, everything changes. Everything changes. So I'm going to pray. And the way I want to finish tonight, because I believe that the Lord is popping things up in your mind. I want to just invite you to come and spend time with the Lord before him here. I don't feel like anybody needs to pray with you tonight. Um, I just think that we need to spend time before the Lord and begin to confess those things over to him and ask him to help us come into agreement with him, to know the truth and to believe the truth and to walk in the truth. So if you'll stand, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I... Uh, The Lord, I pray for those who watch this on the internet right now in Jesus' name. I pray that you are revealing to each person where they are not in agreement with you, where they have come into agreement with the enemy. I pray, Father, that you're revealing the fruit of that to them. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, send your revelation now. Send your revelation now. I feel like the Lord is saying that there's some, there's some who are um, in agreement with the enemy in the way that they um, respond to their spouse. That they that they view their spouse as a um, opposition, as an opponent to their life. That if, if their spouse would only get on their page, things would be better. And the Lord is saying that it's time for you to begin to see the Jesus in them and come into agreement with that. Time to repent. I believe that there's some that are... are um, I, I said it earlier, but I, I, I'm feeling it really strong right now. Some that are, are jammed up um, with pornography. Because you believe that it will meet a need without rejection associated with it. Because you've been rejected and, and in, the, in, the, in the pornography there is no rejection. And the Lord is calling you to come out of agreement with that. Because you're sowing seeds of rejection towards those in your life. I believe that, oh man, I believe that there's some um, who are so jammed up over the political season that you have almost evil in your heart towards those who don't agree with you. The Lord wants you to come out of agreement with that, come into agreement with Him.
I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. Um, I think there's somebody here who has an automobile that, that's more important to them than their children and their family because they value things o over people. I, I don't know. I just see an automobile that, that's constantly cared for, and, and um, it's, it's more important that it be cared for than the people who ride in it. The Lord wants you to come out of agreement with that and come into agreement with him. So, I want to invite you, if the Lord, is, the Lord has been showing you things, the Lord has been showing you things that you need to come out of agreement with so that you can come into agreement with Him, I'm, I'm just going to invite you to come spend time before Him and confess the areas of false agreement and ask Him to help you come into agreement with the truth. And those areas of false agreement, listen, it's pretty easy to identify identify the truth that's just the opposite of what you're believing. Come now. And then as I finish this prayer, I release you to go. And I bless you. So Lord, Holy Spirit, just come. And be, be with us as we go about our days. Empower us to come into agreement with you. In Jesus' name. Amen.